message, please enter your passcode. Your passcode has been... I am Loretta Jackson Brown, and I am representing the Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity, POCA, with the Emergency Communication System at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We are delighted to welcome you to today's COCA webinar, Hantavirus, Little Mice, Big Problem. COCA is excited to offer this special call series with our COCA partner, the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. We are pleased to have with us today Dr. Deborah Carr here to discuss epidemiology, treatment, and prevention of hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. At the conclusion of today's session, the participant will be able to describe basic facts about the ecology of the hantavirus, discuss how the hantavirus is transmitted to humans and the expected clinical signs, state the risk factors for contract, contracting hantavirus, and describe effective control methods to prevent the hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other association with the manufacturers of commercial products, supplies of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of an unlabeled product or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, and the presenter for this presentation do not have financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. This presentation does not involve the unlabeled use of a product or product under investigational use. There was no commercial support for this activity. At the end of the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask the presenter questions. On the phone, pressing star six will unmute your phone. You may submit questions through the webinar system at any time during the presentation by selecting the Q&A tab at the top of the webinar screen and typing in your question. This will place your question into the queue. Today's presenter, Dr. Deborah Carr, is a biosurveillance analyst at Patel Memorial Institute. Dr. Carr earned her doctorate of veterinary medicine from the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine. After a year in small animal private practice, she joined the U.S. Department of Agriculture Food and Safety Inspection Service as a veterinary medical officer. She later joined the U.S. Air Force as a public health officer. In this role, she managed large-scale public health programs, served as an instructor of the U.S. Health, excuse me, U.S. Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine, and completed a Master's of Public Health degree at the Uniformed Services University. Dr. Carr is currently an Air Force Reserve Public Health Officer at the 514th Aerospace Medical Squadron at Joint Base. McGuire Dix, Lakehurst, New Jersey. At this time, please welcome Dr. Carr. Dr. Carr, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. I thought I had it unmuted. Uh, what I wanted to say was thanks, everybody, for taking time out of your uh, afternoon to listen to me talk. Um, I'm not a hantavirus expert in the traditional sense, and I've done research with the virus, but I do have uh, uh, an interest in it, and two reasons for that. One, um, Several years ago, I was stationed at uh, Osan Air Base in South Korea, 
And every year we would have um, the command entomologist uh, come out and actually do surveillance around base where they would trap rodents and send them to Seoul University for testing. And they would do it on our base and also other bases. And not surprisingly, some of the mice uh, uh, and other little rodents in the area would be positive. So one question that always came to my mind is, well, what does that mean? What um, What is the risk for somebody who works in on the flight line uh, in a hangar versus works in an office versus is out in a field environment? And we'll we'll talk a little bit about that later in the uh, in the course of the presentation. Uh, the other thing that piqued my interest happened just late last year, last summer, where there was an outbreak of hantavirus in Yosemite National Park. And um, as we'll mention later on in the presentation, um, the fact that you have hantavirus in a rural area in the West, in California, isn't that unusual. What was unusual is that you had so many cases in one place in a short period of time um, because it was uh, 10 visitors to the park developed hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. And the age ranges of the cases were anywhere from 12 to 56 years of age. Uh, one person unfortunately died of uh, antivirus. Uh, most of the uh, affected visitors came from California, but there were a few people from other states. Um, the California Public Health Department, uh, uh, U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and the National Park Service actually launched a joint investigation uh, to determine the cause. Uh, the National Park Service had to notify over 260,000 visitors about this outbreak, um, and these are those visitors from the United States and also uh, countries overseas. Uh, basically warning them about the outbreak and advising them to seek medical attention if they fell ill. Uh, subsequent, uh, a subsequent investigation determined that nine out of ten of the ill visitors stayed in tent cabins. And these cabins were located in an area of the park known as Curry Village. And the significance of these cabins were they were kind of uh, updated. They, they weren't really tents. They had a canvas exterior and interior hard walls. Uh, so I have a picture of what the interior of one of the tents would would look like. Uh, it looks a little bit like staying in a dorm, you know, a dorm room as opposed to uh, a tent. And that was one of the problems because since there was a space, there was a gap between the canvas and the hard interior, um, investigators found that rodents were actually living in this, uh, in this area. Uh, they were detected within the insulation. So subsequently what they ended up doing on the 28th of August is closing all 28 of these cabins down indefinitely. Uh, to prevent anybody else from falling ill. And normally about, uh, well, other, let me get into it, other uh, interventions that were done was uh, education was, in, about hantavirus was given out to both staff and visitors, and rodent control measures were started to include uh, trapping of rodents. Um, and this this uh, outbreak got a lot of uh, a lot of press, and unfortunately, a lot of people ended up uh, well, a lot of negative press because a lot of people avoided coming to the park. And I forgot to mention it, but the outbreak occurred in the summer between probably about the first of June to the seventeenth of September. Um, and later on in the fall of that year, the uh, California Department of Public Health. Um, did a study on the about 469 park employees. Uh, none of the employees were involved in the outbreak. They didn't become ill. One of the things they did was uh, hand out questionnaires and also do uh, serological surveillance. And at least one of the 569 individuals did test positive for antivirus, but they had never been ill. And 
and another tidbit of information is up to 14% of California's wild mice population uh, is believed to normally carry hantavirus. So let's talk about the virus. I uh, have different, uh, different subsections. We'll go through what it is, where it's found, um, a little bit of history, how it was discovered, how it was, uh, how it can be transmitted, um, epidemiology of human cases, uh, what are the expected clinical signs, um, how communicable is hantavirus, um, one, one key there is it's not normally transmitted person to person, so that's an important point. Diagnostic tests, uh, how to treat it and how to prevent it from happening in the first place. So let's talk about the organism itself. And it is an RNA virus. It's in the family Bumiviridae. And the significance of the genus antivirus uh, compared to the rest of the family, Bumiviridae, this is the only genus that's not arthropod born. Uh, it's transmitted specifically by rodents and insectivores such as moles and shrews. There's over 25 hantavirus species found worldwide. Uh, each one of them is antigenically distinct from each other. And they're each associated with a single rodent species. There's actually, uh, research has shown, uh, that the virus and their rodent host have co-evolved with each other. Uh, so they have a bit of an understanding in that the, the rodent host carries the virus without itself be, becoming ill. Uh, a little bit more about the virus. It has a lipid envelope, and the significance of that is it can be easily killed by common disinfectants such as chlorine or ethanol. Uh, UV radiation, uh, low pH and temperatures at or above 98 degrees can also dis, uh, deactivate it. And it, antivirus can cause, it's, it's considered a viral hemor hemorrhagic fever, and it can present in one of two distinct uh, syndromes. One is hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, which is found in in the New World, in uh, both North and uh, uh, North and South America. And then there's hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome, which is basically found everywhere else. All right, let's look at the geographic distribution of the different hint, different hantaviruses. In the old world, these are some of the more predominant hantaviruses and the host, uh, the, the rodents that they're associated with and what part of the world they occur in. Um, the significance of, if you look at sole virus, that is actually carried by both the Norway brown rat and the roof rat. And generally, these the other species of rodents have a particular range. But roof rats and Norway rats, as you know, are found worldwide. So soul virus has the potential to appear uh, anywhere in the world. These are some of the hantaviruses that are found in South America. Uh, several species, and this is the different countries where they're found in. I put a star next to Andes virus, which can be found in Argentina and Chile. Uh, that's carried by the long-tailed pygmy rice rat. The significance of this particular hantavirus is it doesn't follow the rule. Uh, there have been cases where there's been a, uh, this virus has been transmitted, transmitted person to person. So that's the exception to the general rule that hantaviruses aren't transmitted uh, person to person. Okay, and then lastly, these are the predominant hantaviruses in North America. And the most well-known one is the C. nombre virus, which is found in the western U.S. and then uh, central U.S. and parts of Canada. Uh, that's carried by the deer mouse. Uh, there's also other variations of hantavirus uh, that are found in the eastern U.S. or the southeastern U.S. And one significance is you notice some of these mice 
can have can be found in uh, well they can have overlapping ranges. Significance of that is you could have different sero. It's possible to have different serotypes of hantavirus in a particular area if you have different uh, uh, different rodent species present. And here is just a picture of uh, in the insect the deer mouse and its range, which is really most of uh, uh, most of North America down into Mexico. Um, not so much in the southeast or along the uh, along the eastern seaboard. Then you have the white-footed mouse, which has a bit of an overlap. That isn't found, as you can see, that isn't found in the western U.S., but it is in everywhere else, uh, most of the southeast, except for uh, ex except for perhaps Florida and parts of southern Georgia and Alabama. And then finally, you have the cotton rat, and that's known to carry uh, the black uh, Black Creek Canal virus, which is a type of hantavirus, and that's mostly he mostly lives in the southeast. All right, let's talk a little bit about the history of hantavirus, how it came to how it came to be discovered, and. It actually first came into prominence during the Korean War, which was from 1951 to 1954. You had over 3,200 troops on the front line uh, that developed an acute febrile illness. It was very debilitating. They would have to be taken off of the front line, sent back to, uh, sent back to hospitals to recuperate. Uh, you did have a 10 to 15 percent mortality rate, and the people that did recover, that recovered, often had a very long recovery, weeks to months, before they could be put back into service. So, as a result of this, the U.S. Army uh, set up a hemorrhagic fever commission to try and investigate what was causing this uh, illness. One of the things that they had that they did was take serum from over 245 uh, ill soldiers, and we'll talk about the significance of that in a little bit. It wasn't until 1977, however, that the actual uh, uh, ant antigen was detected in the lungs of a Korean field mouse, and this was called. Hatan virus after the Hatan River, which separated North from South Korea at the 38th parallel. And it wasn't until, and talking about they found the Hatan virus, uh, we're jumping ahead a little bit in time, but in 1990, um, researchers took those serum samples from the ill soldiers that served during the Korean War, there were over 600 serum samples, they found 94% of them had antibodies to Hatan, uh, Hatan virus. In 1979, another type of hantavirus, sole virus, which I mentioned was found in Norway rats, was found in Japan and Europe. And this was discovered after uh, it was about after they found that there was a virus very similar to Hatan that was causing hemorrhagic fever in laboratory workers that came into contact with lab rats. Um, and it's believed that one of the things that helped that led to the dissemination of soul virus was selling and disseminating lab rats worldwide. Another thing would be lab rats or Norway rats and roof rats like to travel. Uh, particularly on ships, so that would be another factor in dissemination. Uh, it wasn't until about 1981 that the Hatan virus itself was successfully propagated in cell culture. Um, one of the things I'll talk about a little bit later is it's notoriously uh, difficult to isolate some of these uh, some of these viruses. Okay, now we're going to jump in time and go to 1993. And what happened there in the United States was what was known as the Four Corners outbreak. And that 
was so called because it involved the convert an area of the United States where four states, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona converge. And this happened to be the site of uh, Navajo Indian Reservation. And these were the people that were, or this was where some of the first fatalities were seen. The outbreak first started in 1993, May of 1993, where you had several previously young and healthy members of the Navajo Nation uh, all of a sudden die of acute respiratory failure. Uh, they would develop a fever, muscle aches, I mean, very flu-like sy symptoms, and then go on to develop a massive pulmonary edema uh, that was characterized as an adult respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, between May, of May to June of 1993, you had over 12 fatalities, and ultimately uh, 27 people ended up dying. The New Mexico Department of Public Health and the U.S. Center uh, for Disease Control launched an investigation, and they tested over 1,700 small mammals because they suspected that it, uh, whatever this uh, virus was, it was in these mammals, uh, particularly uh, deer mice, because over half of the mammals captured were actually deer mice. And they found that 30% of them had uh, antibodies to what's now known as the C. nombre virus. Uh, but before they determined that, they realized that the sera from the serum uh, from patients was cross-reacting with Hatan, Sol, and Humala virus. Um, so it was an odd, it was a very odd outbreak in that. Usually, antivirus will cause a hemorrhagic fever and a renal syndrome, a kidney disease. But this was the first time that it was found to actually cause a pulmonary disease. And then trying to determine what caused this virus to arise, um, in a nutshell, it had, it had always been there, but it did it uh, hadn't been previous, it was previously unrecognized. But what happened during the winter and spring of 1993, uh, that was actually an El Nino year. Uh, previous to that, the Four Corners area had experienced a prolonged drought. Uh, during um, the winter of 1992 to 1993, there was a lot of snow and rain, increased precipitation. Uh, this allowed the drought-stricken vegetation to come back, and subsequently the rodent population grew tenfold. Uh, deer mice, which like to live in rural and semi-rural areas, like to be near people. So they'll be in sheds, wood piles, people's homes. Um, so now you had a proliferation of rodents carrying the hantavirus. Now they were, uh, unfortunately, also in contact with people, so that caused um, caused the outbreak. And going when they went back to do a retrospective study, they found that uh, the virus had been around since at least 1959, if not earlier, um, because they. Uh, Researchers had examined lung tissues of a 38-year-old Utah man who had died from a hantavirus-like illness in 1959, and they were able to determine that it was probably due to the thin number of virus. So the hantavirus pulmonary syndrome wasn't really an emerging disease in the New World uh, because it, there were lots of different species of hantavirus in different rodents populations in both North and South America, uh, South America, just a previously unrecognized one. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the uh, transmission of hantavirus. And basically, the modes of transmission are going to be the same whether we're talking about hantavirus with pulmonary syndrome or hantavirus with uh, or hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome. 
there's an endozootic cycle, which is within the mouth mice itself, and then an epizootic cycle. So in the endozootic cycle, the mice and rodents uh, basically spread it among each other. Uh, the virus can spread in aerosolized feces, urine, and saliva. Uh, they can also transmit it to each other horizontally by fighting, uh, particularly the males, even if they fight over territory. Um, there's no evidence that the hantavirus is transmitted uh, vertically from mother to mother to dam rodent. And in mice, at least, mice are, well, actually all rodents, that uh, one of the reasons why they can coexist with whatever particular hantavirus serotype they carry is they mount an immune response, but uh, it doesn't appear to be a very robust one. So the virus and the mice are able to coexist with each other. Uh, infected animals could carry the virus for weeks to years, uh, sometimes for life. The epizootic cycle is where people get involved. That's where um, environmental factors such as an abundant food source allows uh, allows you to have a boom in the rodent population. Um, you can even have certain geographical hotspots where a lot where a lot of the a lot of the rodents are positive for hantavirus more than uh, usual. Um, like I mentioned, uh, particularly the deer mice, they like to live near people, uh, abandoned cabins, outbuildings, wood piles. So humans are a dead end host, and they come in contact with the virus accidentally when they go into these area when they go into uh, these confined spaces particularly if it, they start cleaning. Uh, one of the common scenarios is somebody has a cabin in the mountains and they go visit it in the spring and start doing spring cleaning to prepare for uh, the summer. Uh, other animals will certainly eat the mice, like uh, coyotes, owls, um, cats but they don't appear to ever become ill from hantavirus or uh, are cap they're not capable of uh, transmitting it to other species either. Okay, let's talk about the epidemiology of hantavirus in human beings. And this is a map from uh, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. It shows hantavirus pulmonary system cases by their state of exposure, uh, and this map is valid as of uh, December of 2012. And as you can see at a glance, the vast majority of cases of antivirus pulmonary syndrome occur in the western United States, uh, particularly four states, Cal uh, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. Uh, other western state states have seen also, um, but you also notice that on the eastern seaboard you've seen a few cases too, such as in Florida and also as far north as Maine. Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome attend, tends to, uh, you tend to see cases in humans in the late spring and early summer. Um, this contrasts a little bit with the hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome, which is primarily spring and fall, and that corresponds to the time when people would be going out into the fields or rice paddies to either sow seed or harvest crops, and they would come into contact with infected rodents. Um, High-risk high risk occupations would be, of course, farmers. Uh, field biologists, if they trap or handle rodents, and pest controllers. Um, pest controllers will usually be, of course, in places like the crawl spaces of houses where they have a high probability of coming into contact with rodents or with their droppings. And then military personnel, there's a potential for that if they're staying in field conditions. And then activities such as camping or staying in uh, Rodent infested, cat infested cabins can also increase the risk. 
And there have been serological, uh, serological studies where they've determined that anywhere from 1 to 8% of the population in Europe actually has antibodies to hantavirus. Um, most cases of the uh, hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome in Europe occur in Russia, Finland, and Sweden. In the U.S., uh, exposure to hantavirus is a lot rarer. Only 0.2 to 0.5 percent of the U.S. population has ever tested positive for hantavirus. Um, South America, there's a really wide range. Anywhere from 1 to 40 percent of the population is positive. And in Asia every year, over about 150,000 to 200,000 people are hospitalized for hantavirus. Uh, the majority of those cases occur in China. And I think, you know, surmising one difference between the different uh, prevalences of cases in different parts of the world is, uh, particularly in Asia, people are um, living in substandard housing or low social economic conditions. They would have a greater chance, of course, to come in contact with rodents or be living in, uh, living in homes where there's a rodent infestation. Okay, let's look at uh, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome in the U.S. itself. And this, these statistics came from a uh, July 2011 article in Emerging Infectious Diseases where they looked at hantavirus from uh, 1993 to 2009, over 500 uh, total cases. And this is, once again, just in the U.S. alone. Um, Incidentally, the uh, U.S. Centers for Disease Control maintains a registry of confirmed hantavirus cases in the U.S. It's done so since 1993, and hantavirus is uh, a reportable illness. Case, cases in the U.S. every year vary from 11 to as high as 48. Uh, the case fatality rate would be 35%. Most of the cases were in adults. Uh, the adults ranged in age from 20 to 50 years of age. But 7% of antivirus pulmonary cases did occur in children. Um, antivirus tended to display a very strong seasonal distribution, and most cases were seen in May, June, and July. Um, no surprise, the highest incident occurred in the southwestern United States. Um, there were no trends over that uh, that suggested that there was either an increase or a decrease in cases. And one thing that the one thing that they found was there was pretty much a similar case fatality rate across all age groups. Um, so you couldn't really say that older people were any more susceptible to dying than younger people once they contracted the virus. Uh, some things that were common among deceased uh, hypervirus pulmonary syndrome patients were increased hematocrits, uh, white blood cell counts, and creatinine levels. And also the fatal cases tended to have very low platelet counts. Okay, and mentioning that, let's talk a little bit about clinical signs in humans. And Probably one of the scary things about hantavirus pulmonary syndrome is that it starts off with very nonspecific flu-like symptoms. Uh, hantavirus has a two to four week incubation period. Um, and the range can be anywhere from a few days to six weeks before somebody develops illness. And at first it's fever, muscle aches, chills, maybe uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. But then it progresses to uh, severe pneumonia to the point where somebody can uh, go from being hospitalized and on a ventilator within less than uh, 24 hours. This is a slide that just shows uh, a radiographic progression of hantavirus pulmonary syndrome in the lungs. Uh, it basically causes uh, bilateral interstitial uh, infiltrates and the, the lungs are being flooded with uh, flooded with fluid. 
hantavirus uh, hemorrhagic fever, not hantavirus fever, hantavirus hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome uh, starts off the same way. You have very nonspecific flu-like symptoms. Uh, you could have uh, facial rash or, or evidence of uh, hemorrhage, thus the name, and then it goes on to cause uh, acute kidney failure. And then you can have death due to shock and hypervolemia. Uh, communicability, I think I've already mentioned this, that there's uh, been no person-to-person -person spread of hantavirus. The one exception would be the Andes virus in Argentina. Animals, um, generally rodents will not show symptoms. Um, in my research, I found that uh, hamsters, they do, do uh, use hamsters as a clinical model uh, for exposure to Andes virus because they will actually develop a, a hantavirus pulmonary syndrome similar to humans. But for the most part, rodents, if infected, whether they're wild or domestic, will not show signs. And hantavirus hasn't been associated with disease in other animals either. Diagnostic tests. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to culture many of these viruses. For example, the C. nombre virus has never been isolated in cell culture. So you have, so, uh, have to rely on serology uh, or serological tests or uh, PCR to detect, uh, to detect viral RNA in blood or tissues. Um, what's advised is that clinicians who suspect antivirus pulmonary syndrome in a patient, um, that they should notify their state health department about how to do the confirmatory testing. Um, but generally, the uh, clinical samples would consist of either serum, whole blood, or tissue samples in a deceased case. Treatment, unfortunately, there is no specific treatment. It's mostly supportive care and early recognition of the disease supportive care can help reduce mortality because, uh, unfortunately, once somebody is hospitalized and has uh, respiratory failure, uh, that tends to have a poor prognosis. Uh, the antiviral drug, Riberavin, uh, can be helpful for the hemorrhagic form of hantavirus fever, but it's not proven to be effective for hantavirus pulmonary syndrome to date. All right, lastly, we'll talk about prevention. And two big, uh, two big uh, concerns with prevention. Uh, one is if somebody's going into a confined space that's contaminated with rodent, urine, and feces, uh, the last thing you want to do is do a dry cleanup, either using a broom to sweep it out or a vacuum cleaner. Um, because that's obviously just going to stir up dust and aerosolize the virus. Uh, wet cleanup is recommended with a good distance, commercial disinfectant or bleach. Um, we would remove the droppings with paper towels and then um, pick, pick it up prior to mopping or sponging areas down. Uh, another key point would be to ventilate any uh, unoccupied structures, like, say, that cabin that's been sitting idle all winter, anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour before occupying it. Once again, that gives, uh, that would help to decrease the amount of aerosolized virus that might be present in the area. Other, uh, other control measures would be trying to keep rodents either out of uh, out of areas, um, trapping or using rodenticides if necessary. Um, don't give them you don't want to give them either food or shelter. So obviously, disposing of trash and keeping food in rodent-proof containers will well, prevent them from entering a structure in the first place. And then, if somebody's out camping, the recommendation is to avoid contact with uh, rodent burrows or nests, and also uh, don't sleep directly on the ground. Okay, so that was a lot of information to cover, but in a nutshell, um, 
antivirus pulmonary syndrome predominates in the new world, whereas in the rest of the world, uh, the disease that you would see would be hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome. And while it's very rare in the U.S., uh, antivirus uh, pulmonary syndrome is deadly. You have up to a 35% mortality rate. Um, it's seen, it's mostly in the western U.S., particularly the southwest. However, cases have been seen in other states as well, and as far east as uh, Maine. And some of the predominant risk factors are uh, usually in the U.S. It would be some sort of contact with wild rodents, either while out camping or by uh, going in and cleaning out uh, unoccupied cabins or outbuildings. All right. Well, thank you very much for your uh, time and attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Carr. We will now open up the line for the question and answer session. You may submit a question using the webinar system by clicking on the Q&A tab located at the top of the webinar toolbar and then typing in your question. To ask a question on the phone, please press star six to unmute your phone, then state your name and ask your question. And so, Dr. Carl, while we're waiting for the first question, mm -hmm. you, mentioned, you mentioned Yosemite Park outbreak. Were there any underlying health conditions for patients there? Yeah, it didn't appear that there uh, that there were, and that kind of makes sense when you looked at that, uh, when I mentioned that uh, 2011 study um, that examined uh, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome in the U.S. over uh, about a 13-year period, because it looked like mortality was the same across all age ranges. Um, so the researchers uh, who wrote up that study concluded that it didn't look like you could really say that uh, um, that age played a factor, so pre presumably it wouldn't really matter. Uh, underlying um, health conditions wouldn't matter either. Uh, it's kind of contrast, and it kind of contrasts with something like, uh, say, seasonal influenza, where usually people who are very young or the elderly, or if you have an underlying health condition, you're more predisposed to uh, predisposed to mortality. In this case, you have an you have an equal chance of uh, dying, whether you're uh, whether you're in ill health or healthy. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Do we have a question from the phone? Okay, on the webinar system, Dr. Carr, I have a question. In Europe, the virus has been transmitted between pet rats and their owners. Do we know if pet rodents in the U.S. carry hantavirus? Good question. Um, as far as they know, as far as uh, I know, the hantavirus pulmonary sin uh, for hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, they haven't seen that in pet rodents. However, they've definitely seen it in the other strain, the hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a recent report in neurosurveillance uh, from February 2013 where uh, pet rats were actually a source of hantavirus in England and Wales. And Wales. Uh, somebody's pet rat uh, caused them to fall ill. Uh, so the Health Protection Agency, um, the UK, actually developed guidelines for how to handle pet rodents. And the guidelines consisted of such common sense things that you probably don't want to pet keep uh, your cage with or your pet rat in a cage in your bedroom. You might want to put them someplace like in a well ventilated and sunlit room. Uh, I think the idea for that is to try and if, if they are carrying the virus, uh, you would decrease the viral load and then common sense things like uh, um, wash your hands after you handle the rodents or after you clean their uh, 
clean their cages or handle their bedding. Um, you don't want to wash their cages and equipment in the kitchen sink. And some pretty good guidelines because in addition to hantavirus, there are other things that pet rodents could potentially carry like uh, uh, lymph- uh, lymphocytic chorio meningitis, uh, which is a virus that can cause meningitis in humans and also rat bite fever. Uh, so I think probably the safe thing to do would be to um, handle pet rodents using those guidelines and um, you know, because I don't, I, I don't worry so much about the hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, but the sole, sole virus that I mentioned is carried by uh, Norway rats and roof rats, so that could potentially be uh, worldwide. Okay, and I see you have another question, Loretta, on the webinar. Right, right. Have there been, okay, have there been any hantavirus fever renal syndrome cases in the U.S.? Um, Yes, there have. Um, and it's normally because of uh, because of contact with Norway rats. Unfortunately, I don't have the specifics of that. I was trying to uh, trying to uh, find some information before the call, uh, but everything was antivirus pulmonary syndrome. It leads me to believe that. to look up that information and get back with you. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And so you mentioned uh, that the pet rodent uh, may be a source for hantavirus. Is that correct? So pet rodents are at risk for transmitting hantavirus to people? Uh, definitely in the U- definitely in Europe and the U.K. Um, they haven't really seen that in the United States. However, I would say the common sense guidelines that they provided uh, that the Health Protection Agency in the UK provided could also be followed by folks in the United States because maybe not so much for hantavirus, but for some other uh, uh, some other uh, zoonotic pathogens that they could carry. So the things that I just mentioned about keeping the rodent's cage in a well ventilated uh, place, uh, washing your hands after handling the bedding or the equipment. Um, that would be, you know, those would be measures that someone could use to protect themselves. Okay, I thank you. Actually, yeah, I actually, if anybody is interested, I could, because uh, they wrote up uh, about a two or three page paper on the, um, on the uh, preventive measures. So for our participants today, if you mm-hmm. would like that information, please email us at COCA, that's C-O-C-A at C-D-C dot D-O-V, and we will get that information from Dr. Carr, and we will pass it on to you. Let's check the phone to see if we have any questions on the phone. So again, if you're interested in asking a question on the phone, press star six to unmute your phone line, and then state your name and ask your question. We'll take a moment for that. Okay, through the webinar system, we do have a question. And you mentioned the treatment and that it's, it's mainly um, treating the symptoms, but there is a question as to whether or not there's a vaccine or a, perhaps a vaccine in the works for hantavirus. Right. There's no... I forgot to mention it, but there's <laughs> there's no vaccine either. Uh, there are experimental vaccines being developed, particularly in Korea, uh, but there's nothing right now that's commercially available that you'd be able to take and protect yourself against hantavirus, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Sure. Right. So we'll go back to the phones. Do we have any questions on the phone? I don't think we have any further questions on the webinar system. Do you have any closing remarks before we wrap up the session, Dr. Carr? 
no, I think I I think I pretty much hit the um hit the high points of what I wanted to say. I mean I certainly don't want to leave uh uh people in fear of their of their pet rodents. Um there's in the US I hadn't come across any literature talking about people being exposed from coming in contact with their pet, you know, their pet rat or their pet hamster, whatever. It's mostly wild wild rodents. Okay. Well, excellent. Thank you. Sure. So, on behalf of COCA, we would like to thank everyone for joining us today, but a special thank you to our presenter, Dr. Carr. If you have additional questions for today's presenters, please email us at coca.com. A at cdc gov. Put Dr. April fourth Coca Call in the subject line of your email, and we will ensure that your question is forward to, forwarded to the presenter for a response. Again, the email address is coca at cdc gov. Hey, Dr. Payon. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. uh, this is David Guzman. I'm here. So, uh, you uh, with your road. Uh, at Ichoka, thanks so much. And it, uh, Dr. Carr, this nice okay. presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Billsby. Thank you. Free continuing education credits are available for this call. Those who participate in today's COVID conference call and would like to receive continuing education credit should complete the online evaluation by May 3, 2013, using course code EC1648. For those who will complete the online evaluation between May 4th, 2013 and April 3rd, 2014, use course code WD1648. All continuing education credits and contact hours for COCA conference calls are issued online through PCE Online, the CDC Training and Continuing Education Online System at the number 2 the letter A, dot CDC, dot GOV, forward slash TCE online. To receive information on upcoming COCA calls, subscribe to COCA by sending an email to COCA at cdc.gov and write subscribe in the subject line. Also, CDC launched a Facebook page for health partners. Like our page at facebook.com slash CDC health partners outreach to receive COCA updates. Thank you again for being a part of today's COCA webinar. Have a great day. You may disconnect at this time.